He uh, got his undergrad at Bowling Green State University. And the first time I got to meet Justin, he was actually a, a research experience for undergrad students. So he took part in a program that we have up here um, while he was an undergrad. And, and, and post leaving Bowling Green State University, he got both his master's and his PhD at the University of Toledo. And he spent a lot of time looking at this question right here, um, cyanobacteria or, or harmful algal blooms. And I'm actually going to ask Justin to kind of just give you a little insight into, before he jumps into his talk, just one or two minutes to talk about uh, where he was when he was uh, in, in your stage of your career. And so was he straight line trajectory? He wanted to know where he, uh, what he wanted to do from the, the age you guys are to where he is now, or, or was it kind of a, a bounce around path? And so I'm going to have him just kind of introduce, introduce what his uh, career aspirations were and, and how he got from there to here. And then uh, we'll have him jump right into the presentation. So if you'll join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Justin Chapman. I got interested in, in water uh, out Lake Erie in general when I was very young. Um, I'm from the area, not too far south of Lake Erie. Um, I spent a lot of a lot of hours out on the boat, uh, out fishing and swimming in Lake Erie. Uh, graduating high school, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do, so I went to a small branch campus uh, of Bowling Green State University. Their um, their small firelands campus. Uh, I initially start. I knew I wanted to do something in science, but you know, it's very broad. I know I, I know I didn't want to do business, so <laughs> I wanted to do something in science. Um, I started off in nutrition. Don't remember why I started in nutrition, but um, for that, one of the required classes was biology 204, which is like the, the introduction to life. You know, so you talk about all the different types of organisms, and I got really really excited about when we did the water stuff. Uh, so as I was at Firelands, I learned about Stone Lab uh, off a little uh, a little note, note board. Uh, I saw a flyer and I looked it up. And I did. Wow. <laughs> 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 yeah, so I started, I started out as a student at Stone Lab. I was in, uh, in your seats 13 or 14 years ago. Uh, I did an RU with, with Dr. Doug. Uh, we looked we looked at mayfly bioturbation. You know, mayflies, you've probably seen a few of the adults around this week, but they their larval stage is in uh, they live in the bottom of the lake and they create they they create these little U shaped burrows and they move around the sediments and they kick up mud and phosphorus. And we got the we published the paper a couple of years after that. And if Doug didn't like what I did, he was chasing around with a muddy stick. Uh, yeah, so I, you know, I had a lot of research experience um, as an undergrad. Before I did my RU here, I did an RU at the, at the University of Toledo studying zooplankton. And when I went back to Bowling Green, I, I helped a student in, in Jeff Miner's lab with, uh, with crayfish behavior. So I did a lot of research experience as an undergrad, and I would encourage anyone who's interested in grad school or science in general you know, to volunteer for a professor's lab. And they might probably probably won't pay you, but just getting some experience in a, in a lab setting, you, know, you might start off by just, just washing dishes or you know, doing very simple things, but those simple things can add up to, to, to better They add up. They look really good on a resume. So as you're going through your college career, think about how can I build my resume. You know, it's not. You know, you might want to get a summer job or a job after school, like McDonald's or whatever. But that doesn't help you on a resume. Right? It might help you get a little bit of money, but a better option would probably be to work in a lab, get something on your resume, volunteer for a zoo, find some internships. So. You know, getting a, a college degree is great, but everyone's getting college degrees. How can you stand out with, with a simple degree? Um, and then from there, I went to grad school uh, and came here. So my path was pretty much a straight line. Sometimes when you when we have these lectures, uh, you know, someone starts in accounting, then they go into chemistry, then they go back to psychology, and then they bounce all over. 
I was the opposite. I was more of a straight line, and it worked out for me. So I'm talking about algae. Uh, so just a general introduction. Um, you probably learned about algae this week. Uh, most algae are not bad for lakes. Algae are tiny plant-like organisms that are suspended in the water column, or they can grow on the bottom of the lake or rivers attached to rocks or sticks or anything that's on the bottom. And algae account for 50% of the Earth's oxygen. So every other breath you take, you should thank algae. Algae are the base of the food web. Uh, algae are consumed by small shrimp-like creatures, which we call zooplankton. Zooplankton are eaten by small fish, and bigger fish eat small fish. And there are hundreds and thousands of species of algae in the lake. They come in all different sizes, shapes, and colors. Uh, all but they all require sunlight. They need fertilizers like phosphorus and nitrogen, and they need carbon dioxide. They use these three ingredients to create sugars and oxygen. So the algae are critically important for lakes and rivers. The Lake Erie produces most of the fish of all the Great Lakes because it has the most algae. Lake Erie has the highest nutrient concentration and it has a, the warmest water in the winter. Those two factors interact to support a large food web and support a large fishery. Uh, we often say here at Stone Lab that Lake Erie has 50% of the fish, but only 2% of the water of the Great Lakes, whereas Lake Superior has 2% of the fish, but 50% of the water. This is because Lake Erie has a lot of algae, a lot of, a lot of beneficial algae that support uh, a very productive food web. However, too much of the wrong type of algae is harmful. And we often hear the term harmful algal bloom. And the way I define harmful algal bloom is harmful means it has the potential to produce toxins or and or it can have harmful impacts on the ecosystem. The word algal um, and freshwater, we in, in Lake Erie, for example, we have blue-green algae, which are more correctly called cyanobacteria. An example of a green uh, harmful algal bloom is a red tide. And bloom is a, it's not a scientific term, it's just a general word that describes a biomass that exceeds what's normal. So the lakes or the ocean shouldn't be green. So harmful algal bloom is a large biomass of algae that is harmful to the environment and or producing toxins. And Lake Erie has had a share of harmful algal blooms. Um, you can see how they just color the water, um, and in calm conditions, the harmful algal can float to the surface, create these thick scums. It can concentrate near our docks and wash up on shores in, in very thick green, thick green, looks like paint sometimes, like the green paint still, but actually this is living material. So the, the main blooms that we have in Lake Erie are a type of cyanobacteria called microcystis. Uh, cyanobacteria are also called blue-green algae. When people first started looking at water under a microscope back in the 1800s, uh, they knew what green algae were. And they saw these other cells that were bluish green, and they assumed, well, since they're living in water, they must be algae. So they called them blue-green algae. It wasn't until the mid around 1920, 1930-ish is when they learned that they were actually bacteria. Uh, they're true bacteria, but they require sunlight, so they, so they do photosynthesize. Uh, microcystis produces the, the toxin microcystin that was responsible for the Twitter water crisis in 2014. Right, anyone from Northeast Ohio? Three, four, five of you? What happened in, uh, I'm sorry, Northwest Ohio? Okay, so about the same number. Uh, and you probably remember what happened in August a couple years ago. You were told you shouldn't drink their water. That's uh, because the toxins that was produced by the, by the algae in the lake got into the drinking water supply and it was above the, the, safe, the safe limit. Uh, microcystins are a liver toxin. Uh, in, in that event, about half a million people were told they could drink the water for about three days. There are other algae. Other harmful algal blooms in Lake Erie, uh, Sandusky Bay by Cedar Point, uh, 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 has planktofrix. The central basin uh, 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 has Dilicus spermum. And we also have uh, cyanobacteria blooms that grow on the bottom, which are mainly dominated by lingvia. 
these balloons are visible and the biomass is quantifiable from space. This is an image from uh, October 2011. And these images come from NOAA Lake Erie Hab Bulletin. Uh, twice a week during the summer, they, they send you via email a satellite image of Lake Erie. And then they can extract data from it. And this bottom picture here, the red, the red areas are high levels of cyanobacteria. Greens and yellows are medium. Blues and purples are low. And black is none. And you can see how the true color image matches the data. So you can see, like, there's this little hook out here. There it is there. You can see how it kind of squiggles out over here off Cleveland. So the blooms are visible and can quantify the biomass basically from space. And those satellites have been in our atmosphere since 2002. And we can look at each year and see how big the bloom was that year. Each image up here shows the snapshot for the most intense bloom during that, uh, during that summer. And you see there's a lot of year-to-year -year variation. So 2002 was a small bloom. 2003, that was the big bloom uh, of that time. That really got scientists' attention. And that was, quote, unquote, the record bloom up until about 2008. And 2010 passed 2008. And 2011 broke the record again. 2015 broke that record. But every year, no matter how big the bloom is, there's always some bloom near the mouth of the Maumee River. So you can, like 2005, you can see here in the corner, uh, there, and the bloom's always in near the mouth of the Maumee River. And also to point out on this slide, Sandusky Bay, that's the little, the little spot right here. It's red every year. There's a plankton search bloom at Sandusky Bay every year from April through October, November. So it's, that's a different story. Um, what I'm focusing on is the bloom, the offshore bloom. Yeah, like I said, you know, we always see these blooms near the mouth of the Maumee River. That tells us that's where the source of the nutrients are. And the Maumee River is uh, the largest watershed in the Great Lakes Basin. And it's about 80 to 85 percent agriculture. So we have the largest river draining into the shallowest basin of all the Great Lakes. So what's driving these blooms? Um, back in the 1960s and 70s, the, there was an argument about what's causing these blooms. It was is it carbon or is it phosphorus? To solve this. Um, uh, one example from a study done by David Schindler, uh, this lake is in, uh, this lake is in, uh, in Ontario, and it's shaped like a figure eight. And in the center, it was divided with a, uh, a curtain where water could exchange, chemicals could exchange back and forth. So the top half of the lake, he added carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus, and a dense bloom developed. On the bottom side of the lake, he added carbon, he added nitrogen, no phosphorus, no algal bloom. This research and other examples like this pointed that phosphorus is critically important to blooms. And uh, the mass of the Western Basin bloom can be explained by phosphorus load from the Maumee River. So I showed you, you know, where the, where the Maumee River drains into the Lake Erie, and there's always some bloom. In years or I should say in springs, March through July, when more phosphorus gets into the lake, we get a larger bloom. Okay. So in, um, when in 2000, 2015, 2011, these were very wet years. It rained every day or every other day. It rained a lot. 2011, 2006, 2012, these were drought years. Okay. So more rain, more phosphorus, larger bloom. And knowing that information, we can forecast how big the bloom is going to be. Uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago now, we, uh, knowing the mass of phosphorus that's getting into the lake from the Maumee River, and knowing this relationship, we can predict the bloom is going to be somewhere between like a five and a 
going to have a balloon this year. It's already started. It's getting underway. So, and it'll get bigger, but it won't be as big as it was last year. It'll be bigger than it was in 2016, but not as big as 2017. So, so we can forecast biomass. Um, and since we know we know where bio, where the biomass is, because the satellites fly over every day and they tell us where the where the bloom is today, we can take lake lake current models. So Lake Erie is not a stagnant hole. There's currents that that move around, and we we know the current. So if we know where the bloom is today, and we know what the currents are doing, we know where that bloom is going to go in the next couple of days. That's what that's what's provided in the NOAA Hat Bulletin. Uh, you can see this bloom; it's kind of centered in the uh, centered in the center of the basin. These currents, all these little lines are arrows, and they're kind of pointing north. So they forecast that the bloom is going to move north. And so we can forecast biomass and forecast location. However, what we're more what I'm interested in, a lot of people are interested in. Is toxic. So, how toxic is the bloom going to be? We there are still a lot of unanswered questions about what can what controls the bloom to produce toxins. And a toxin forecast cannot simply rely on biomass. This is data we've been collecting since 2013. Uh, this slide um, it has a lot of data. There's over 800 data points. And you can see is a large scatter of data points, right? But if we zoom into the, the lower range, where uh, within this range, this is where 98 percent of the samples are. So more often than not, you're going to experience these sort of conditions in Lake Erie. Uh, this is still a huge range of cyanobacteria. When you get over 50, that's very green water. So we've seen almost up to 300. Most times you're less than 50, definitely less than 100. And you can see you cannot predict toxin concentrations based on biomass. So if you can have these really dense blooms that are non-toxic, you can have very little, very little biomass that is extremely toxic. Okay, so you can't look at the water and say, say it's green, it's toxic, or it's clear, it's non-toxic. So the rest of my presentation is going to go into what's driving this pattern. So in this research, we, we investigated uh, different forms of nitrogen and phosphorus, we looked at light intensity and the in interaction between light and nitrogen. Uh, we looked at the co-occurrence of toxic and non-toxic strains of microcystis, which I'll talk a little bit more in the next slide. And we, this research approach, approach used Experiments, so in lab, and also taking measurements, taking collecting water samples from Lake Erie. So lab-based and field-based research. And this is a, a, a an image of microcystin LR. If you, if, you have, if you have had organic chemistry, you might not know what this thing looks like. Uh, but you see a lot of ends on here. Those are all nitrogen, and there's no P's in here. So there's, nit there's nitrogen in, in these toxins. There's no phosphorus in these toxins. So why might nitrogen be important for cyanobacteria blooms? Microcystis cannot grow, or it cannot make microcystins a toxin without a source of combined nitrogen. By combined nitrogen, I mean nitrate, ammonia, urea, other forms of organic nitrogen. Uh, microcystis cannot use atmospheric dinitrogen gas. There are some cyanobacteria that can that, that can use atmospheric nitrogen, but, but microcystis cannot. Like I said uh, last slide, uh, microcystins are 14% nitrogen by mass. Microcystis is only about 7% nitrogen by mass. So if you're a microcystis cell and you're going to make this toxin, you need a lot of nitrogen. Making microcystins are expensive in terms of nitrogen. Looking at some data, this is some data I collected when I was doing my PhD at the University of Toledo. This is from Maumee Bay, so near near the mouth of the river. Um, data from 2010 and 2011. Nitrate concentrations are on the top, 
the units are micromolar per liter. We have May through October. And both years, you see nitrate concentrations drop in almost in the same pattern in those two years. And it reaches really low, low detection limits. And these Lake Erie blooms, they occur in late July, August, and September when there's very little nitrogen in the water. Uh, most research on cyanobacteria has been focused on phosphorus. And nitrogen has, until recently, been overlooked. So one of our re research questions we, I have is, what's the impact of low nitrogen on bloom growth and toxicity? Uh, we have a, a sample site right out here. There's a buoy that, that collects data every 15 minutes. And several times a week, my, my assistants will drive out to the buoy in, in our little boat, tie up to it, and take a water sample right next to that buoy. This is an example from 2016. The black dots are nitrate concentrations. Again, you see that there's no decline of nitrate. And the red triangles are the ratio of toxin to cyanobacteria biomass. And you see, overall, there's lots of variation, but overall, a decreasing pattern. And that de decreasing pattern follows nitrate concentration. So there, uh, the cyanobacteria are producing more toxin per cell. So the cell's making more toxin early summer when nitrate than it is late summer. And we saw this for the past three years. Uh, 2015 was that massive bloom. We had extremely high levels of nitrate, but also the water was very muddy, which I'll talk about later. But as nitrate plummeted, so did that ratio at the end of summer. In 2017, again, we see the nitrate plummet, the toxin ratio plummet, but then uh, nitrate jumps back up by about 25 micromolar, and you see what happened to the toxicity per cell. It jumped way up. So in the field, they got more nitrogen, they grew more toxin, they produced more toxin. And this paper was just published uh, a couple weeks ago, Environmental Science and Pollution Research. So I, I, met, I, I mentioned toxic and non-toxic strains. Um, in order to produce this toxin, you need 10 different genes. Okay, they're, they're called microcystin genes, and they're labeled A, through J. You need all 10 of them. If you miss, if you lack one gene, that renders you non-toxic. And toxic and non-toxic strains co-occur. So a toxic strain has all 10. And we can quantify the genes out in the environment by qPCR. Uh, has anyone heard of eDNA? Nobody has heard of eDNA? Okay, a few of you. Okay, well, I won't mention it then. But, but we can... Uh, we can grab a water sample and measure the amount of genes present. Uh, this data is from NOAA um, from 2014. Again, we see nitrate concentrations drop. Phycocyanin and PC is the measure of, of biomass here. So, so biomass peaks several times in 2014. Microcystins, the toxin, Again, it follows the, the nitrate pattern. And the bottom is the percent of, of microcystis that has all 10 genes versus total microcystis. So earlier in the year, about 70 to 80 percent of the microcystis in the lake was able to, pr to produce toxin. When nitrate goes away, only about 10 percent can produce toxin. So we see a shift not only in the amount of toxin being produced per cell, but also a shift in the gene pool from a lot of toxin producers to very few toxin producers. And nitrogen is driving that, that, that pattern. So that was an example of the field research uh, we do. We also do experiments. And one way to determine what factor is constraining growth in the lab is with experiments. Uh, this is a cartoon, uh, this cartoon diagram to kind of help explain it. Uh, 
you have your control. Oh, oh. Uh, so you have lake water that is in the flask or a beaker, and we spike it with phosphorus, nitrogen, or phosphorus and nitrogen together, and we have a control. So this is what it would look like, you know, as we scooped it up from the lake. It all, it's all blue. You know, whatever is growing there, it's all going to be the same. And then, then we incubate it. If we give it more phosphorus and the water turns green, that means phosphorus was the main constraining factor of growth. If they stay blue when you give them nitrogen, that means there's already enough nitrogen present. And and in phosphorus and nitrogen, you know, because you gave it phosphorus, it turned green. So this is an example of phosphorus limitation. You'll have nitrogen limitation when the nitrogen bottle turns green and the phosphorus bottle stays blue. And sometimes you have the you have the scenario where they need both phosphorus and nitrogen at the same time. An example that I do when I, when I teach, um, you, know, you know, if you're building a car, you need one steering wheel and four tires, correct? If you have one steering wheel and ten tires, how many cars can you build? One. Okay. If I gave you more, if I gave you twenty more tires, how many cars can you build? One. So in that example, the steering wheel is the limiting factor. If I gave you one more steering wheel, now you can build two cars. So that's how they, these experiments work. Uh, that August 2011 bloom, that was at the time the record-breaking bloom, it was phosphorus limited. We gave it, perhaps it was nitrogen limited. We gave it phosphorus, and it was the same as the control. When we give it nitrogen, biomass jumps up a lot, and when you give it phosphorus and nitrogen together, that's when they that's when they grow the most. <coughs> And many other research groups have documented that that phytoplankton growth is nitrogen limited in Lake Erie and in many other lakes around the world. When you have these dense blooms, they're more likely constrained by nitrogen than phosphorus. I'm not saying phosphorus isn't important, but once the bloom gets going, the bloom in that state is limited by nitrogen. So, so phosphorus determines the size, the, determines the overall size, but in in any given uh, point, nitrogen is, con is limiting. And again, so here's a picture of, of what's going on in those experiments. So if you don't believe data, but you believe pictures, you can clearly see which one is more green, the ones with nitrogen. And, and nitrogen occurs in many forms. Um, it can occur in organic, like urea, and amino acids, or it can be or ammonia and nitrate, which are inorganic. It can be reduced or oxidized. So this adds this adds more complexity to the nitrogen question. And also, which makes it a lot more complex than phosphorus is it's cycling within a lake. Uh, so you can have all different types of nitrogen flowing down a river. There's nitrogen in the rainwater, and within the lake itself, you know, nitrogen being sucked up being excreted, it's being released from the sediment, um, uh, it can be changed up back in the um, N2, but there's lots of, well, there's a lot of cycling of nitrogen. So we can get, uh, following a storm, it, the, the nit nitrate concentrations can be extremely high, over 100 micromolar, so we get this huge pulse of, huge pulse of nutrients that come down at once, one time giant pulse. Or we can have this low sustained recycling. So ammonia in the lake is turned over. Right? It's turned over. Um, so, it's, so you can have nitrogen that's entered in the system in one big pulse or a much slower sustained recycle. So a couple of experiments we did is look at what's the difference between one giant pulse of nitrogen versus a slow sustained pulse. And this is a uh, here I'm, I'm showing toxin concentrations uh, and the control and the phosphorus were very similar to the initial levels. And then when we gave it nitrogen, no matter what form or at what, or at what rate, it produced more toxins. So this tells us that you know, they're going to use any form of nitrogen to give them. If it's nitrate, ammonia, or urea, 
And it didn't matter if we gave it to them in one big pulse or several small pulses over, over the duration of the experiment. So microsystem doesn't care. He'll use whatever nitrogen you give it and how, how fast you give it. We also looked at, at the gene expression. Um, so if you haven't had your, or if you don't remember your general biology, you have DNA, right? And then RNA is made from DNA, and then RNA makes proteins, right? And then the, in this example, the proteins make the microcystin. So we, we want to look what's happening to these genes. How fast are these genes being turned on or turned off? So we measured the amount of RNA that was in our experiment. And we, we took samples four after we, we took samples four hours after the experiment began. So you see the control and the phosphorus are only very similar to the initial. And nitrate was also similar to the control. But when we gave it ammonia or urea, after, and this is the one time big pulse we saw the gene turned on within four hours. Looking at the, the small pulse, um, again, we saw that ammonia and urea also turned on the gene. And these are after only 8.3 micromolar of nitrogen has been added. So it doesn't take very much nitrogen to get them going, and it doesn't, as long as it's in this reduced form, a little bit of nitrogen will make them produce toxins. Yeah, so small and large pulses are reduced nitrogen, increased microcystin gene expression. And looking at, at the end of the experiment, we see this expression is maintained, but now we see that nitrate has um, the impact. So, so there's this, uh, you know, if it's using ammonia or urea, there's that immediate gene that starts on. With nitrate, there's, there are several steps that have to happen in order for it to produce toxins. Also, we wanted to look at is there an interaction between nitrogen and light? So we started doing this because a 2015 bloom it was massive, but there was a lot of it was massive. There was a lot of nitrogen, but it wasn't producing a lot of toxins. But also, the water was extremely muddy that year. We had lots of wind that mixed the entire lake. So you know, it was nonstop wind that year. The lake out here, the water is pretty clear right now. If you came here in 2015, the water was pretty brown. Uh, so, the reason why this might have an in impact is microcystis likes to be near the surface. It likes the high sunlight. Um, whether if it's clear water or if it's the muddy water, microcystis likes high sunlight. There, there are other types of cyanobacteria, like plankton, like lower light. So they might hang out a little bit deeper in the water. It's going to be a pop <coughs> for you. What, what's, the, what's the photic zone mean? The region where photosynthesis happens. Yep. Yes, yeah, so the, photos, the photic zone is where, where photosynthesis exceeds respiration. And what is the 1% light level called? It starts with a C. Compensation depth. Compensation depth. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> And of course, if the water is muddy, that compensation depth is going to be much higher in the water column. The light is the, the, because the sediments and the algae are blocking light from penetrating deeper. So we, again, very uh, we 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 did those experiments, but since we saw that you know there was no difference between um, one giant pulse of nitrogen versus many small pulses, we just gave them the one giant pulse. And we grew them at three different light levels, um, a high light, medium, and low light. At the high light level, you see this biomass here, so uh, nitrate, ammonia, and urea, they stimulate growth at high light. So microcystis needs high light, and it needs nitrogen. There's also a little bit of growth, but at, um, at, 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 um, at the medium light levels, but there was no effect of nutrients at the lower light. So they need nutrients and, and high light. And looking at toxins, um, same experiment, but slightly different format of the graph. The white bars are the high light levels. The gray bars are medium, and the dark bars are the low light. And you see nitrogen.
nitrate, ammonia, and urea at high light through toxins. It grew, to it grew cyanobacteria, and those cyanobacteria were producing toxins. So, so, so now I hope I convince you that nitrogen is important and can maybe help explain the relationship between uh, toxins and biomass. So we're working on developing a, a toxin forecast. So there are several components that we need for a toxin forecast. First, we need to know the ratio of toxic to total microcystis, right? If you have a population of all non-toxic microcystis, we need to know that. We need to know that and we need to be able to forecast that. We know that is affected by nitrogen availability, and it is also potentially affected by light. We also need to know, we need to know the microcystin production rates. So, we, so now the next step is okay, we know how much toxic microcystis out there, how fast is it producing toxins? So we're going to do these experiments, which we we done one a couple weeks ago, we're going to do one next week. We're, uh, within the next few years, we're, in, we're going to do 12 of these experiments to, to quantify the production rates at ambient and elevated nutrient concentrations. So, so how much toxin is being produced per gene copy? We know that, and then we know how fast it's being produced. And if we know how fast it's being produced, and we know where it's at, we can forecast what's it going to be in the next couple of days. In order to, in order to do that, we need to be able to forecast nitrogen concentration. And luckily, this has already been done. There's a, a very complex model called the Western Lake Erie Ecosystem Model that takes a lot of different factors takes the Maumee River loading data, wind, current, uh, other factors, and it can model nitrate concentration. Uh, so the dots up here, um, they did this for five different years and at three different sites in Western Basin. The red dots are the measured data, and the blue line is what the model predicted. So you can see the red dots right on top of the, of the blue line, this tells us we can predict nitrate concentration. If we know nitrate concentrations, we should be able to predict that toxic to, toxic to total ratio. And if we can quantify how fast they're producing microcystin, we should be able to forecast that. The next step for a toxin forecast is where is that bloom going to be? So we know where the bloom is based on satellite. And we know where it's going to go based on current. So this is how we can tell, um, for example, water treatment plant here on the island, hey, there's going to be a toxic bloom heading your way in a couple of days. Get ready. So if the bloom's down here and it's producing toxins and it's forecasted to go towards the islands, we can alert those, those, water, cleaners, those water treatment plant managers. Or alternately, if the bloom's out by the island, the current state of the bloom is going to get pushed towards, towards Toledo, which happened in 2014. In 2014, they all had that early warning, so they can prepare themselves. The final thing for a toxin forecast is what happens, what happens to the toxin after it's produced. Does it hang around, or does it get degraded? Um, so in fact, it actually does get degraded quite rapidly. Um, again, you can see what we don't need to go through this, but we, we can quantify uh, each pieces or each um, we can quantify each fragment of little microcystin that got smashed apart. And if we know how fast it's being produced and how fast it's being degraded, we can get a net net production or net loss rate. Combine that with the currents where it's going to go, and combine that with the satellite image where it is. We that's how we're building our forecast. So that's what we're doing. We're 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 going to integrate the blood, integrate the biological parameters such as microcystic biomass and the toxic the total ratio into the Western Lake Erie system ecosystem model into the FBCOM model. And so once we have all these results in this fancy model, we can predict it. The next thing to do is, is get it out to the public. So we're working with the people who make the NOAA have bulletin. And the NOAA have trackers. So hope, 
hopefully in a couple years, after you sign up for the no habit and then they send you an email showing you here's where the bloom is, here's where it's going to go. Our goal is to incorporate the, the toxins into that forecast. And so this will in, uh, increase public awareness and wider treatment decisions. So if you have a toxin forecast, uh, this example, uh, this picture is the squiggle intake in the western basin. It's where the water comes in, so you can see all the green scum right on top of the water intake. If you know how, if you have the toxin forecast, then the, water, the folks at the water treatment plant can prepare for that. And if they can pre prepare for the for more toxins heading their way, they should be able to safely treat the water, which will lead to better and safer water for consumers. Uh, so this project is being, um, there's a lot of individuals from all these different universities and institutions that are working on this project. Um, it's funded by NOAA EcoHab. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the previous results that I showed were, were funded by Ohio Sea Grant, Ohio EPA. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and a couple other of uh, the Ohio Water Resource Center, Ohio Department of Higher Education, which we're getting uh, a lot of funding now through them. Uh, the buoy out here was donated by Fondrice Environmental. And a lot of this work, the hands-on work, is conducted by our staff and students uh, here at Cell Lab. Uh, so with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. So, has a question. So, has the size and sort of intensity of algal bloom increased in the past, say, fifty years? Yeah. So, um, so not just in Lake Erie, but around the world. Mm -hmm. So, the blooms are, um, you know, climate change you know, getting warmer, and cyanobacteria like it hot. So that's allowing them to occur earlier, allowing them to occur. North, more southern, and also there are more people in the world that are you know, dumping their trash down the, the river, which is causing blooms. Unfiltered, you know, untreated water, if there's long hair, so more people are putting more nutrients into, into the lake. And in Lake Erie, extensive blooms are mostly driven by rain, which dries runoff, and because we're having a lot more storms. In spring and summer, that we now have more blooms in Lake Erie. Within the within the past 15 years, we have more blooms now than we did the previous 15 years. So, as the microcystins are being broken down, are those different forms of it? Are they also toxic as well? No. So once the once the toxin is, is broken, um, that's the first step. Well, there's a couple pathways that toxins can, de can get degraded. Uh, there's one that's well known with the example I showed you, but, but there's reason to believe there's a, another unknown pathway that happens in Lake Erie. That first cut, no matter what pathway it does, renders it non toxic. Just when you showed that W lean model, the one that comes out of the window tech. The forecast there, what you showed in the three panels with the three lakes, that was just for nitrate. But as you showed elegantly earlier on in your work, that urea and ammonia are actually driving that more. So is there a model out there that actually predicts those two forms of nitrogen as well as nitrate? No, so there, there's not. Um, and, uh, and that's a good question. We're Right now, the, the model only does nitrate. Uh, it, it can be modeled based on what's happened in the past. Um, for ammonia, uh, you know, there was no, there's no known rate of ammonia regeneration. I know there's uh, a lot of research being done by uh, researchers at Wright State University that are quantifying how fast ammonia is regenerated from the sediments and regenerated within the water column. Once they have that, we should be able to take their numbers and plug in ammonia. So you use the nitrates then to infer what the ammonia was in that 
take a 10 minute break. We'll all uh, rejoin at 8 o'clock and then I'll uh, introduce Director Craig Butler from the Ohio Week. Yeah. Justin has this nice linear career path and how'd you get where you are? Mine's nice, nothing like that. But I didn't go from accounting to science to philosophy, but it's just a, it's a little interest, a little bit different. So let me ask you this first: Mansfield University of Pennsylvania. Anybody hear of it? Ever hear of it? No. Yeah, maybe Dr. Doug heard of that one. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mollis Pennsylvania State School in Pennsylvania. They have a they have a system like we have here in Ohio of uh, state schools. There's like 13, 12 or 13 in the state. The smallest one, North Central Ohio, is where I grew up, close to the close to home. It's where my wife Tammy is here with me and Hannah. Who's wasn't around then, but Tammy's back there. She comes here, faithfully comes with me when we come do this all the time. And, and uh, she is already, Justin, signed up for the NOAA ad forecast. She's back there <laughs> typing away. I'm like, well, I can just send it to you on Friday. She goes, no, I'm going to get it before you do. <laughs> and, and so, um, 
Shoshone University is a, is a cool, small university. And I, I went there, believe it, here's how I characterize the whole thing. My dad always said I was, that I was an overachiever and underachieving when I was in high school. So think about that, right? <laughs> I.e., I was a slacker. And, and I think what he was thinking was, he never came out and really said it this way, but I think what he was thinking is, okay, if you're going to go to college, why don't you stay close? Because if it all goes to hell and it's in, you got to come home, I don't want to have to move you very far. <laughs> right? Kind of a slack. And so I went. I uh, had no idea what I wanted to do other than, you know, if you think about northern Pennsylvania, northern Pennsylvania is about as remote as you can get in, in the state. Very rural, uh, very wide, wide open uh, ag agriculture as well as forest and plants. Just a wonderful place to grow up. So I spent my childhood outside, and I loved it. So I just gravitated that when I was in, in college. I studied uh, business on the side, which I loved, but I didn't want to go into business either, Justin. You and I had that same same piece of that career path, but I also um, didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. There were two professors that just took me under their wing, frankly. So one taught me how to learn, which was my business professor, and the other one was a geography, to, geography professor uh, that got me interested in the science. And from there, it was, you know, get your degree. Came to Ohio University, very long story that I won't tell you, but um, basically I went, I went there to their environmental studies school just because it was as much a self-directed program. I could spend as much time in the law program and political science and policy departments as I was over in engineering, geography, geology. And that was appealing to me. Um, ended up at Ohio EPA, which is another crazy long story, but I started as an intern. So Jason mentioned about working at McDonald's versus getting an internship. Get an internship. By the way, if anybody needs an internship, <laughs> we hire a bunch of them. <laughs> we hire about 100 or 150 interns every year. So if you're in Ohio, you want to work in Ohio, you want to be a paid intern for us, we pay pretty well. We hire them throughout the summer. <clears throat> we put out our application, call for applications in late January, sometime in February time period. So keep an eye on our website for that. Uh, we go through the interviews. All of, our, all of our water quality interns are basically out every day collecting water quality samples, um, collecting fish samples, collecting bug samples for a lot of the long-term aquatic work that we do. Uh, that feeds into a lot of the work that gets done to the universities that pick that data up and help us translate it into what we need to be doing in terms of development of policy and regulation to protect human health, public health, and the environment, which is our really two-phase mission. I always say that our third, third piece of that or our third leg of that stool for me is protection of public health, protection of the environment, and uh, driving economic development in the state because you can't have any of those without all three of those. And so that's been 28 years for me as I've uh, started as a college intern, worked my way through different jobs in, within the agency, and then uh, working for Governor Kate Pixie asked if I would be the director, which is just one of those things you never expect, number one, you never dream of, number two, and, and, and it happens. So, you know, I kind of pinch myself on any other day when I'm not waking up having frustrations about water quality, water chemistry, microsystem, had people without water. It's a fun job. It really is. It's cool. So, if you're interested, pursue it. Um, it's, a, it's a fabulous resume builder. Uh, we hire a lot of our interns, frankly, um, particularly the good ones. Uh, we throw the other ones to the curb and send them to Michigan. <laughs> I had to get one in, Dr. Doug. I had to do it. I had to do it, even though I'm from Pennsylvania and I didn't go to Ohio State and I'm not part of the rivalry, but you know, this is on Ohio State ground, so I, I had to throw it in. So my career path is, a, is uh, maybe, maybe not uh, too crazy, but it's it's certainly not as linear. I had a lot of different choices to make, and I think I'll leave you with one one idea: be flexible. You know, explore new ideas, think about different opportunities. If you like it, great, keep going in that direction. If you don't, it's like I, I jump off that ship and go do something else. We call it adaptive management in the science world, right? You you do something and you test it out, and if it works, great. And if it doesn't, you adjust adjust your um, sighting a little bit and then carry on in a different direction. Do the same thing in your career. Do something that makes you happy. You're going to do it a long time. You know, 30 years seems like forever, but you're going to do it well past that. So do something you enjoy. Uh, if you do something you enjoy, you'll always be successful at it. That would be the advice that I give when our interns come in. So I'll give you the same advice. So I'm going to pick up and talk a little about, before I get into like a deep dive on some case studies about drinking water contaminants and this, <clears throat> this acronym here called PFAS that you hear a lot talk about, which is about per and, per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. It's a mouthful after dinner. Uh, let me just step back and we're going to do a quiz. 
Jason had a quiz. You got quizzes tomorrow. You got tests on Saturday. But this is intense learning, so I'm going to give you another quiz. Um, this is by show of hands. So this is like pass fail. How many people raise your hand if you brushed your teeth this morning? Did anybody fail this one? <laughs> uh, see, I think everybody passed. That's good. So here's the follow-up to that. It's a two-part. You got your brush, lathered some paste on there. Before you, before you, took, you turn on the spigot, and before you put that brush under the water, how many, how many of you show of hands said, "I wonder if that water's safe." Oh, my wife Candy, be quiet. She did not. <laughs> she did not. Nobody. Nobody did. So we spend a lot of time. Chris says I demoralize him every time I come up here and talk, or I talk to him about you know, all the ills in our drinking water. We're talking about microcystin, we're talking about harmful algal blooms, we're talking about toxin in water, we're talking about telling the mayor in Toledo on August 2nd, 2014 at 945, I had to call the mayor. I was the one that called the mayor and said, Mayor, you've got toxin in your water, you can't feed it to your half a million people. We scare the hell out of ourselves. And I'm going to scare the hell out of you later tonight, too, we're talking about all these other emerging contaminants. But remember this. Remember this. this. This country, on par, by and large, we produce the best drinking water the world has ever seen. And you should feel safe about um, taking your toothbrush or taking a drink of water um, and being thinking that that water is safe and that it's safe consumption and it's not going to hurt you. There's a, there's, there's a couple of ways that you can really scare the public, and that is one telling them that one of the life-critical systems that they have, i.e. drinking water, is contaminated. And so we work really hard in this country. We work exceptionally hard in the state of Ohio to make sure that water is safe to drink for all of our public water supplies. You, this, is not a, a, a question, this is not a quiz question, but Ohio has 50, or the U.S. has about 55,000 public water supplies. So Putin Bay, the island, public water system. They've got, they take water out of the lake, they treat it, distribute it out for public consumption. There's 55,000 of those in the state, 12% of those are in the state of Ohio. Out of all of the states in the country, we have 12% of them. So that could be as large as the city of Columbus, the city of Cleveland, the city of Cincinnati, Toledo, millions of customers, or a really small number like a trailer park, um, or a small um, distant community that has maybe 35 connections. Working with the community over in Northeast Ohio, they have 35 connections. We're frankly trying to regionalize them into a system to somewhere else because the actual technical complexity and the cost of running a public water system to make sure that that water is safe, not just for uh, chemicals, but also uh, just making sure that it has enough water is really expensive. It gets technically more complex every year. Uh, and frankly, we have thousands of water systems in Ohio that should not exist. And in fact, if I could wave my wand and I had one thing to do, is I would figure out how to regionalize those systems so we had something like in the neighborhood of how many public water systems the state of Kentucky has. The state of Kentucky is about half the population of Ohio. Uh, they have 500 public water systems. And they have spent the last 25 years regionalizing across the state. Now they can take water and move it technically from one end of the state to the other. Now you would not want to drink that water by the time it got there because it'll take a long time and it'll have a lot of things like disinfection byproducts and a lot of other stuff in it. But just the fact that they can regionalize that water and help each other and use a size and scale uh, to be able to provide safe drinking water is, is something that uh, we need to pursue in Ohio and we will be doing that. So of our 55,000 systems in the country, and of our 15 or 12,000, 12,000 some odd systems that we have in the state, what we worry about every day is making sure that that water is safe to drink. And we do that by a process of working with federal EPA in the state of Ohio to make sure that we're testing that water. Public water systems are testing that water every day. They're testing it against a whole suite of organic and inorganic chemicals and metals to make sure that the concentrations are below what either Ohio EPA, the state of Ohio, US EPA, ATSDR or other organizations have said it is safe, either as an acute toxic number 
or is a chronic long-term health concern number? So they're doing a lot of testing every day to make sure that they're below that. Um, they're also on the lookout. Every year we're going through this very long process with US EPA to say, well, what else is out there? What should we be looking for? There are any number and thousands of chemicals and compounds that, that nobody is testing, that we know exist, or frankly that we don't even know exist, um, and they need to do the research like with institutions here at Ohio State and the International Institute of Health and ATSDR and all the rest of those organizations and EPA to say, here's a compound or chemical we're finding in drinking water. Is it something, is it, is it emerging uh, chemical of concern that we need to do some long-term studies to say it needs to have what we call a maximum contaminant level that then the public water systems test every day to see if they're below that. So what I'm going to talk about today is much like microcystins, um, we have other emerging co compounds that are in drinking water. I'm going to talk about, because this has been um, in the news recently, and I think maybe you, some of you have heard of this as I get into a little bit more, these emerging drinking water contaminants called PFAS. Now, I lost my pointer. Here we go. Let's see. Here we go. And so I'll talk a little about uh, a, a, a few of this. We have knowns and unknown emerging contaminants. There are these known contaminants that we have, that we know that there are a lot of compounds out there that we're just not testing for. Nobody is doing testing. Um, and then we have the completely unknown off-the-wall contaminants that have not yet emerged on our plate yet to even begin to think about it. ABS is one of those. We're going to talk today about these per and polyfluoroalkyl alkyl fly substances. Um, and really the expectations, if you will, about drinking water have changed. Nobody thought about drinking water. Not really, the public did. The public just said, I turn on the tap, that water's safe to drink. And historically it has been. Flint. Toledo, um, Toledo with our water crisis for the harmful lava blooms, Flint, as you all know about lead, the crisis they had around lead, switching out a water source. Um, there's been lots of other um, instances around the country, too, for lead and lead contamination. But it, it, to me, it's raised this collective consciousness about drinking water. People want to have the conversation. And frankly, they're starting to say, before they put their toothbrush under the sink in the morning, is my water safe? And there's just not the foregone conclusion that they think. They think it's safe. It's coming out of the tap, and it's coming from that public water supply, so therefore it must be safe. People are asking, is it safe? And then what they're then asking to say, <clears throat> if we don't know the answer to that, if I can't tell you the answer to that, then they want to know very, very quickly. And part of this story, when they get to the end, is how we in Ohio and states are pushing these organizations at US EPA and others to accelerate the science on this as fast as you can, not to the point where you disturb the science and the scientific process to get the right answer, but we have to accelerate this because the public is starting to demand that we provide answers quicker and faster and, and, and within the, a scope that they can understand that it should take. So the federal process that we, that we participate in, as they all do public water systems, about this emerging contaminants. Um, there have been these maximum contaminant levels, or MCLs, for treatment, or treatment techniques, they call them, two separate things, for about 80. That's it, 80 contaminants. I'm going to tell you that there's, just for these per PFAS substances that we're talking about, there's 3,500 of them. And we know about five. Justin talked about, you know, microcystis, and we've got all different congeners of that. How many of those? 100? About 150 of those, and we know enough about how many? 12. Right? We're getting better. We're getting better. So you can see that the mountain mountain is really mountain is really high uh, for us to overcome this. Now EPA to say when we're, when we're going down a process to say what are these new emerging contaminants that we need to be studying? First thing they'll do is they'll develop a candidate list based on the science literature. Um, and in 2016 they had 97 contaminants that just they just put on the initial. They threw them on the board and they stuck. We had 97 more that were candidates. We reduced that down to 40 that EPA begins the process of doing the science. And so what they do in terms of monitoring is they go out to all the large public water systems in the country, um, including some in Ohio, and they say, we're going to require you to merge, monitor these emerging contaminants um, through, as you can see, this 40 through 2020. And this is just collecting, like you are all doing here, collecting your baseline data. Um, right there, you can start to see it, that we're veering away from the way that the public thinks, who wants instantaneous answers to really complex scientific questions, is my water safe? We'll get to you in 2020. 
they don't understand that, right? So that's part of the risk communication process that we're, we're talking about accelerating this. EPA takes this monitoring data and, and they start looking at lab capacity, uh, treatment capability, and other factors including um, if it will regulate any of the contaminants or find um, how expensive is it. I mean, that, that has to be a true um, attribution here. Is it really that expensive? Is it too expensive to treat? This idea about treatment capability. So we may know there's a contaminant out there. We may even think it might be harmful, but can we treat it? If we can't treat it, then how can we set a maximum contaminant level to hand off to a public water system to say, treat your water down to this number? So that and well as lab capacity. And I'll share an anecdote with you about lab capacity. We're talking about these for PFAs. I'm just going to call them PFAS because I can't get it. Um, if you just talk about these PFAS compounds, um, and I'll get into this later in the presentation, but the, the original um, health advisory number used to be at 200. It actually used to be at 400. Say it was at 200, EPA instantaneously lowered it to 70, 70 parts per trillion. You ask the question, how many labs in the country can test for that, legitimately test for that? There were eight. And so their prices went up a lot. And so that, that is a, a problem that we see. Can, do we have the lab capacity to do it? Um, this is distressing. Since the process began of looking at emerging contaminants, and that's called the Safe Drinking Water Act Amendments in 96, we've decided definitely to regulate one new contaminant. Out of the 80 that we regulated under the Safe Drinking Water Act, we've added one, which is perchlorate. And they set a health advisory number, which is Kind of has less scientific heft to it than a maximum contaminant level or a rule or a treatment technique, but they set a number. Give them credit. They set a number for one. And if there's enough evidence on human health impact, EPA may set this HAL or health impact level, and there's HALs for more than 200. So that's the good thing. Okay, so we put one more on the MCL list, but they've added 200 to the harmful to the harmful. Uh, health advisory level numbers. Sometimes states follow health advisories, sometimes they don't. It's an advisory. It doesn't tell you that you should drink it, it doesn't tell you that you shouldn't, it doesn't tell you that you ought to warn your public about it, it doesn't really do anything other than say it's a health advisory level. What does that mean? I'm advising you that it's in there. It doesn't say that you should drink it, that you don't, that it has a long term, that it has huge impacts, it's just an advisory level. But nonetheless, they've identified 200 of those since 96 where they have some concern. There's a level that they put out there to say, if your water's above this, you should start having some concerns about how you bring that number down. So these PFAS compounds are really a broad family of organic, synthetic organic compounds that were developed by 3M, a Minnesota company in the late 40s, and have been used worldwide. And I will scare you all to death and say, if they took a blood sample out of every one of you in the room, you have it in your blood. And why do I know that? Well, and we know that because we've taken samples and samples and samples. We have it, and we find it everywhere. They find it in soil samples on all, every continent. We find it in polar bear blood. You want to tell the joke? No. Okay. <laughs> I'll leave it alone. Uh, <laughs> it is ubiquitous. So. The most common species of these PFAS compounds are these two, PFOA, PFOS, uh, and we're benchmarking with the other states to identify what industry types and potential sources, but I will tell you they're vast. In industry, they're used as surfactants. Soaps is good for reducing friction. They're great for reducing friction. 3M used this to make Teflon tape. Uh, if you're in the plumbing business, you know what Teflon tape is. They used it to make nonstick coatings for your pans. So instead of you know grinding over a Brillo pad to get the get the whatever your hamburger ground up, they just said, well put this nice nonstick coating. It'll slide right off. You see all the infomercials, right, where they take the cheese or whatever, and they three o'clock in the morning they burn it on the pan so it's black, and they look, whoop, it just whisks right off. It's coated with, in many cases, a lot of these perfluorinated compounds. It's also an aqueous uh, film forming foam or AFFF uh, for fighting petroleum based fires. Uh, the military loves this stuff. They blow it everywhere. <clears throat> and for it, so it's great when it comes out of a fire extinguisher. 
It's in nonstick uh, cookware, food packaging. It's in clothes because every time you see soil and stain or water resistant clothing, DuPont Stain Master, that's it. That's it. You say, well, I want to put that's on my clothes. You, know, you drop ice cream down the front of your shirt, and you're like, oh, that'll come out in the wash because it's got these compounds in it that are really slippery. I will just say, here's a here's where an example of where you're using the AFFF foam in a simulator of an aircraft, an aircraft fire at an Air Force base. And these are test pits where they have sprayed this AFFF for decades. And there is one really, really unique environmental factor of this stuff. It's really slippery. So as soon as it is laid in the, on the, in the ground, either by de deposition, by either spraying AFFF, uh, or you deposit it in a wastewater, or you have air deposition through, uh, through a stack at a manufacturing facility that uses it any way that it gets into the environment. It'll eventually make its way to the surface. As soon as it hits the surface, it doesn't bind with anything because it's made to be slippery. Where does it go? It goes immediately to drinking water. It goes immediately to groundwater, which is drinking water for a lot of folks. We've had uh, these PFAS compounds are relatively new and Ohio, you know, we're at the forefront of just about everything, both good and bad. Um, there is a facility at uh, Parkersburg, West Virginia, it's a DuPont Camores Washington Works plant that uh, we became aware of, US EPA became aware of, state of uh, West Virginia became aware of in the early 2000s. And we started uh, monitoring air deposition and water deposition from this, from this facility. And the air pattern, Air dispersion patterns from that plant, which is here, we're in Ohio on this side, looking across the river, the air deposition and wind patterns from that particular place in West Virginia flow typically from east to west. And so we see air deposition of all these perfluorinated compounds in Ohio. And we saw them just, we saw a significant amount of that contamination of the Ohio River, um, substances under the Ohio River. Um, they did a lot of landfilling of the material. They just had it, they had it everywhere. Um, so we spent a decade working with DuPont to basically, there are many of the water systems along that take water out of the Ohio River or they take well water up from near the Ohio River to put <clears throat> granulated activated carbon systems on their public drinking water treatment systems to take this material out. So we started way back when. The levels we were treating to then were at 400 parts per trillion. We've got some recent examples, and I'm going to talk about this one here, the Newport Volunteer Fire Department. That's a good one. Wright-Patterson Air Force Base I'll also talk about, as well as the Dayton um, Fire Training Center, Toledo National Air Guard Bases. We've done some testing around all of our Air Guard bases to make sure we didn't have off-site contamination affecting public water or private water supplies, and thankfully we only had one. We were able to actually hook up one home to a public water supply and manage that. Um, but this is also a national discussion that's going on um, around the country, states are having this discussion to find out, you know, where do you have this material? And it stays in the environment, too. It's very persistent. So when you see it, say, for example, you take all of your stain master or DuPont clothing, your sticky pants, and you throw them in the trash and they go in the landfill, that stuff ends up in the landfill leachate. That landfill leachate goes to the wastewater treatment plant. That wastewater treatment plant does its process and comes up with a sludge. It's coming along for the ride, and then we take it and do land application of those those sludges as a fertilizer back on the environment. So we see this cycling of this material too. We'll talk about Wright Pat Air Force Base. How many here familiar with Wright Pat Air Force Base? There we go. We got some. It's uh, Dayton, Ohio. Smacks right together. It's like a right right up against Dayton, Ohio in uh, southwest or western Ohio. One of the largest Air Force bases in the country. It's exceptionally important to the defense of the country. They also operate drinking water systems um, in, in the area for their, their residents, so their own public water supply. They get water out of the Great Berry, Berry Valley Aquifer, which is uh, extremely prolific in the western part of the state. Um, and they use groundwater as a source for most of their treatment. And the city of Dayton's water system also uses groundwater as its source, and they've got well fields that are down gradient of Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, which is, which is a, 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 an element here that will be very important. So when we became aware that there was this PFAS present in White Patterson Air Force's uh, drinking water system, we learned of this because they were participating in our emerging contaminant sampling at the national level. 
and the, the levels that we were looking for at the time were at 200 parts per trillion. And we got uh, information from US EPA and us that said that their samples were just over the 200 number. And so we met immediately with Wright Patterson and said we recommend that uh, they take those wells. Uh, we need to determine which ones were being impacted first, went through a round of treatment or a round of uh, sampling with them and figured out which wells um, that they had that were impacted and basically just said, you need to take them out of service. Uh, you can't, there's really no treatment here. These wells are really extremely large. Um, so the development of building of a, of a, a, a treatment system, basically a, a granulated activated carbon system was not something that they could do very quickly, so they eliminated them from use. So here's uh, just an idea where their production wells and the monitoring wells and where we found the perfluorinated compounds. Um, you look at the Mad River and the Buried Valley uh, aquifer, you can see the concentrations in the monitoring wells where we're seeing a lot of this material. Um, here you have here you have uh, a lot of the monitoring wells that were done because this is around Huffman Dam. This is the, the one of the largest public water supplies for the city of Dayton. Uh, we're finding it even outside of uh, the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base uh, footprint, but we see it in these buried valley aquifers. And what you see is how large these uh, well systems are. So you see that one's pump pumping about 21 million gallons a day, 42 million gallons a day, 93, 25 million, 38, 23, 7 million gallons a day. I mean, that's meeting the public water needs. They're just pumping massive amounts of water to serve the public need, and they're, they're having a real impact on drawing this contamination to itself uh, from these areas. So this is where I say in May of 2016, uh, after EPA set this um, health advisory level at 70. I mean, literally, they called the states on a national conference call, and I'm really still bitter about this, too. You can, can tell. They called all the states on a national call and said, uh, we're going from 200 to 70, and we said, when are you going to do that? And they said, starting today. And we said, boy, that's really nice. Uh, so the uh, we had to then go back. We knew we had this source at Wright-Patterson. We knew we had additional wells that were over the 70 that exceeded this new level, and we then also had to require Wright-Patterson Air Force Base to no longer use the well, issue a drinking water advisory to their residents that were on the base, and to say, do not drink the water, and require them to provide bottled water to their sensitive populations for a time, um, and said, you also have to stop using the well. They decided they weren't going to do that, so I had to use my emergency enforcement authorization powers to force them to do it. Um, and that made me very popular with the base commander, as you can imagine. Um, they took that out of service. They're, um, basically, Wright-Patterson is now working with us. They're going through uh, this entire process to figure out which wells they have contamination and are they above the 70 part per train, are they not? They've also built some very large treatment uh, uh, capabilities, which I have a photo of here. And so this just goes through this more of a chronology about how we've been working with we went from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base to then we said, you know, Dayton wells are very close to that. Uh, we need to start sampling in the Dayton water supply because the Huffman dams and the, the many millions of gallons of water that they're pulling down gradient from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. We need to make sure those wells aren't contaminated too. March of 2018, December 2017, we detected uh, PFAS compounds in the raw water going into the Ottawa drinking water plants. We detected it going into their finished water still. We have finished water detections well below 70, uh, but it's a number that's concerning to us because I'm going to tell you when we get to the end why that is. And so we went on a massive sampling campaign around Wright-Patterson Air Force Base to say, where in the heck is this stuff coming from? And so you can see all of these are different monitoring locations for PFOA and PFOS as we went back uh, across the entire base. Now, we had some preferential ideas of where they did it. They have fire training academies. They have fire training pits. They've had accidents. They've had fires. Uh, so we had some pretty good idea where they were uh, where they were using this material. And we started there, and we got some very high numbers in thousands <coughs> of parts per trillion, so in the parts per million. And this is where we started talking about fire training centers. But then, you know, we always thought that this contamination of the Dayton well field was strictly because of Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Oh, no. No, no. 
in February, we get a call from Dayton saying, yeah, we have some of our own fire treatment training areas around uh, the city that we forgot to tell you about. And so we've been in this massive data gathering exercise with not only Wright-Patterson, but with the city of Dayton as they're monitoring wells and soil boring is showing that there is significant PFAS contamination even within the four corners of the city of Dayton. So we're going through and making them do the same investigation that is going on at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. We've also required them to put a sentinel well system around their, their public water supplies monitoring that they have so we can start separating what is coming from where and who we basically can go and say they have to start the treatment of that process. This is our extensive sampling network when we look at Dayton's water supply. So you thought we had a lot of sampling locations for the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. This is what it looks like for our groundwater sampling campaign that we have for the city of Dayton. This is why we have a lot of interns. <laughs> it's good work. It's hot, it's sweaty, but it's a lot of fun um, basically going out and doing that. So we've basically uh, worked with um, both Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and Dayton. They're, they're working on how to imp move this water around through their system so they stay below 70 parts per trillion. They can do that by differential pumping in their systems. They can do it by limiting the impact and viability of the production wells. They do it by taking production wells offline. And, and it's really uh, kind of still under development about how we actually go and do removal of these contaminated sites. We know where we have all these fire training areas. We know where we have really significant hotspots. Um, there's, this is where policy meets science. This is where politics meets science in some degree. You, got, you talk to the military and say, you know you've got these fire training areas that have really, really high uh, co concentrations of perchlorinated compounds. I said, yes, we do. And they said, well, go dig them up. And they said, well, we can't. And we said, but we know this is a contributing source. This is acting as a contributing source to contaminating your own groundwater as well as that for the city of Dayton. Yes, we do. Well, why can't you go dig that up? Well, Congress won't, <coughs> Congress won't let us spend the money on it unless, one, it has an NCL for a maximum contaminant level. And I'm like, okay, we don't have that. Or if it's designated as a hazardous substance under the hazardous waste law. It's not that either. Uh, or... You get the idea. They basically said, we can't dig it up. I'm going to, you know, if the base commander says, they're going to come put me in jail if I spend money digging that material up until a certain few things happen that designate this material as a hazardous substance. Or frankly, you uh, in the state of Ohio set a statewide number, which is the maximum contaminant level, and then I can be forced to go do that. So both Dayton and uh, EPA want Right Pat to implement these measures to protect health, but we also want Dayton to do some things that are also protecting their health. And I won't go through all this, but and I'm gonna, this, is a kind of, this is a system, one of the largest granular activated carbon systems that we've ever seen built. And this is on the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base base. This entire system, you can just see part of the architecture here. You just get a sense of the size and the scale of this. I'm starting to wonder here. That is. This right here treats two wells. So you can imagine there's not enough carbon to be able to fix the problem just by saying we're going to treat it. So we have to get into these areas, identify potential sources, and then also do excavation of that material. So we've got this elsewhere in the state. And frankly, we haven't even begun testing across the state to find all of this material. But this is a, an, interesting, uh, an interesting example. The city of Wyoming, the suburb of Cincinnati, they had a house fire. Routine, quote unquote, routine house fire. Three alarm fire. They had, uh, and they had uh, volunteer firefighting companies coming in from other communities. They basically pumped so much water out of the public water system on the fire hydrants that they depressurized all of the city of Wyoming, pushing water on them. At the same time, they were using AFFF firefighting foam because they had petroleum-based contaminants in the garage of the house. They in a public water system, like with, like the one here, you've got an anti-siphon system, so you're not sucking water back into the system. Firefighting trucks apparently don't have a siphon check valve. They were siphoning, sucking, siphoning AFFF back through the fire truck into the public water system, and they didn't know it. So they, 
contaminated the public water supply until residents and homes adjacent to the fire reported that they had foam coming out of their tax the next morning. And they called us. And we went, oh boy. So so there's a, there's a picture of the fire, and there's the foam coming out of the fire hydrant. Um, so we issued a do not drink advisory for as small as 40 homes. They were able to frankly get in um, because they had good asset management, turn their valve, wall off this section of the, of the city. So it really only was affecting a small population. So to me, that was like the bullet zipping past our ear. We could have had the entire city impacted with this, but, but they had really good maintenance on their system. And when they turned the valve, they didn't break, they could wall it off, and we had just a small uh, part of that community impacted. Uh, but what we also didn't know is not all, all triple F doesn't have perfluorinated compounds in it. So we had to work really hard with all the firefighting companies to figure out exactly which firefighting foam they used. And oh boy, they weren't using the same foam. So we had to all go get the different material safety data sheets from all of them and then work through with US EPA to figure out which of those were part of these families of perfluorinated compounds or not. Basically, they were under a do not use advisory for, a, you know, for a, about a week. Um, and we were providing uh, through Wyoming bottled water uh, to impact residents. <clears throat> they did a really nice job. City manager, they let them come into the rec center and take showers and sleep there if they needed it. But, you know, overall, you, it's just like a cautionary note. This is a national example. Uh, this one little example caught national attention from every firefighting, uh, every firefighter organization as well as US EPA. So we've done some really national level case studies on this uh, to try to keep this from happening again. Um, Again, I'm not going to go through all this. They basically flushed it out of the system. We told them they couldn't use it. Once they were done, they collected the samples. They were below the 70 parts per trillion, and things were good to go um, by April 27th. Oh, boy. Who's that? That's me when I have to, like, show up at work and wear a tie. <laughs> um, so one of the things that I told you at the beginning is uh, states are pushing then-Administrator Pruitt, now-Administrator Wheeler at the, at the head of US EPA to uh, address <coughs> some really key issues on these compounds because the public is hearing about these examples, you know, the Wyoming examples. They're hearing about Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. They're hearing about um, North Carolina is a hotbed for this material for another kind of PFAS called Gen X. Um, but the public is asking questions. Is this stuff in our drinking water? And the answer is yes. Is this stuff safe to drink? Well, all I got now is a 70 part per trillion health advisory number, but I can't tell you whether that's something that is really safe or it's really not. We've gone from 400 to 200 to 70. Where are we going next? And where's the science going to land to say you have a maximum contaminant level of either for one of these compounds or a collection of them at a certain number that we can then start directing systems to do treatment of? So we address, a, we, we suggested that they address, oh boy. Uh, that you address these PFAS chem chemicals as a class versus an individual. And I say that because remember how many of these are? There's 3,500 of these. And you, we're working on two. And we're never going to be able to work through all of those in any amount of time that the public is willing to give us to get this. We're saying try to de deal with these in, a, in an entire class. Um, there are conflicting state numbers. There's a health advisory level of 70 for a national level. States are moving on their own. Typically, states move much master, faster than the federal government does on some of this stuff. In, in some cases, that's great. In some cases, it's not. In this case, I would say I don't think that it's healthy. Um, but nonetheless, you see states like New Jersey. State of New Jersey is going to – anybody here from New Jersey? State, from, state of New Jersey is going to introduce this combined um, PFOA, PFOS, Gen X number, a combined MCL for their state, maximum contaminant level. It's going to be at 14. Uh, Massachusetts, uh, New Hampshire, and others have gone and said they're going to do, take the number at 70 and still use it, but say it's a combination of all of those compounds. Because it is a fair, it is a fair statement to say if you find one of these, if you test for PFOA or PFOS, and you find any one of those, you will find them all. And so they just lump them all together. We've got a number of states that are moving very quickly because they feel they need to, and it's their absolute right to do it, but I just think it's going to be hurtful to set their own maximum contaminant level, which is then going to start driving this national dialogue to say, what's the standard for the rest of the country? What is it in Ohio? Is it 70? Is it 14? If New Jersey's at 14, what's Ohio doing? 
and it's important to us because even in the limited sampling and case studies that we've got, Ray Patterson Air Force Base, City of Dayton, finished drinking water levels, 14. And if, and if that is an MCL number for us, that then is us telling that community of two and a half million people in Dayton that they should not drink their water. And that is a big deal. Also about analytical methods, we still have, uh, you know, not many labs that are capable of doing this. I just spent a half a million dollars buying a piece of equipment so we can do it in our lab. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're fortunate. Um, a lot of states don't have that capability. And then how do you communicate this risk about what we do know and what we don't know to the public? So we have to, we have to suggest to the administrator a four-step action plan, uh, begin the necessary steps to call it a hazardous substance so we can go back to all of our um, Air Force bases and all our military installations that have this material to allow them to un unshackle them, take their handcuffs off to say, if you have it, now you go dig it up. Um, develop groundwater cleanup remedies, remediations for PFO and PFOS. We've got one number, 70 parts per trillion for a drinking water number. We've got no number for soil. So if you have it in the soil and you're digging up, I can't tell you when to stop unless it's zero and you're never going to get to zero. Um, develop toxicity values for these others, Gen X, um, PFBS, PFBX. There's this whole suite of these that are coming along that they need to either treat them as a class or get moving on what these um, concentrations need to be. So overall, this is really an unfinished story, and I think it will be for a long time. We are working with EPA and the other states and participating in all these other risk communication groups. We're working with the EPA to develop this state strategy for response when we start seeing these. We're working with EPA uh, on a number of things, and then we're developing our own lab capability just because we're about ready to springboard off and start doing some strategic sampling around the state of Ohio um, of, of our public drinking water system so that we can identify where this material is. Last but not least, there's the whole Ohio River system, you know, at the other end of the state of Ohio. Um, we and all the other states are testing uh, Ohio raw river water because it was done probably 10 years ago, and we don't think the science is really robust, but we find it. It frankly elevated concentrations in the Ohio River as well um, from other manufacturing operations, including the one that was there at DuPont at Washington Works near um, Parkersburg, West Virginia. So having said that, it's really an unfinished story. It's not designed to scare the hell out of anybody. <laughs> Have confidence in your drinking water. Understand that there's a lot of still a lot of unknowns and a whole lot of science yet to be done on whether it's these perfluorinated compounds or any other of the known or unknown emerging contaminants. There is a process. It's a very lengthy process. We have to speed that up. We have to meet the public's expectation about um, is their drinking water safe. We have to continue to be able to answer that question with as much capability as we can and what truth as we have that there are some risks. But by and large, your water's safe to drink, your water's safe to use. You shouldn't give second thought, um, at least in this country, frankly, about whether you turn on the water and stick your toothbrush under there, whether you feel safe using your drinking water in the country, because there are thousands of these public water systems, and there are tens of thousands of people that wake up every day, and it is their only job. And it's a one of the hardest jobs I think you could have is making sure water coming out of their plant is safe to drink. It's a huge responsibility. I, I think my job's hard sometimes, but I think that job would be really, really, really difficult. So we, every time I get a chance, though, I thank them for their hard work um, and try to help them as much as we can. So, doctor, that's it. Communication is really, really tough. Um, I've got, I've got a, a group of 
folks that that's really what they do. You know, my whole communication staff is, our job is all about communication of risk. You know, it's a, a public health risk, environmental risk, and then the confluence of those. Um, it's tough. You know, US EPA, I was just on the way up here, you know, they've got the new administrator, Andrew Wheeler, who's from Ohio. We're, we were talking to him on the way up, and one of his core priorities for as long as he's there is improving the ability for the federal EPA to communicate risk. Their massive failure on risk communication, Flint, Michigan. Um, I think they did a much better job because uh, what, when you communicate risk properly, it doesn't become a national story. So think about uh, Kilauea Volcano and the air monitoring that, that, that was being done there because of the sulfur SO2 emissions at really hazardous levels. And only were they able to get in front of that by having getting monitors in place um, in, in populated areas and then being able to communicate to the public in a way that they trusted that the, that the actual data was safe, where they could just go in their home or they could not go in their home. That was a success for them. Um, maybe it was more the county of, uh, in, uh, in Hawaii versus EPA, but it was a good success, good success story. It's really tough. The public is very fickle. Um, they will turn on you at a time. <laughs> it's tough. You generally, in risk communication, people generally are upset you know, when you don't have a complete answer for them. When they can't give them absolute 100% certainty, they get upset by that. Um, but and you can never then, then it becomes more sometimes of an irrational response where they say, I demand to know 100% of the time that I'm safe. It's, not, it's impossible. And that's not the way science works. That's right. Yeah, that's, you know, for those kind of butt heads. They, they butt heads every, every day. And the worst thing that I think that you can go out and say, you know what, your, your drinking water is 100% safe. You should never be concerned about that. Um, you should be able to say, we do a lot, we do a lot to make sure it's safe as it can be. But there are inherent risks in everything that you do. That's the best answer you can give. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, still millions of millions of Ohioans and millions in the country get their water from private wells. Um, you, know, you, you get outside of a, a community metropolitan area and you quickly run out, run away outside of a public water system and people drill their individual wells. Those are all regulated by the state health departments um, and the county health departments uh, versus Ohio EPA. Um, and frankly, some of the requirements that they have are kind of a, a mix depending on what county that you're in. Probably not as, and this is all over the country, it's probably not as robust as it should be. Um, but they have some of the same testing parameters on an individual well that you would have for a public well. It wasn't long ago, we had our own public water crisis right here on, not this island, but that island in Putin Bay. Um, all of these islands are stacked on a big piece of limestone, right? So they, they would drill their own wells, they're really shallow wells. They also didn't have public public sanitation wastewater treatment plants here, um, so they found they were drinking their own sewage, which is not uncommon. Um, and so we had a crisis here where we needed to get public water system put in and get every one of these homes on the island hooked into a public water system because there's just not enough biomass here to do natural treatments for the wastewater to make sure it's safe for drinking. So um, that is something that happens often, and um, I think by and large, Public water systems, private wells can be run um, exceptionally well and they can be safe, um, but they do have inherent risk in, in them as well. Yes, sir. So these PSAS chemicals, what can we even do to try and remove them? Because yeah. you were saying they're just everywhere. They are everywhere and they're, and they're very persistent. Um, it's probably a stretch to say that, but it's a good analogy to make anyway. They're kind of like PCBs, you know, that they're very persistent in the environment. They stay a very long time. <clears throat> Treatment-wise, what is effective that we know is, um, and it's one of our standby kind of gross treatments for organics, and is uh, granulated activated carbon. 
and you saw the systems that we built in Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. They're very large. Um, and, the, and these systems here are uh, these granulated active carbon systems that we put in on the communities for uh, in West Virginia and Ohio. They were using a granulated activated carbon system for a different kind of these PFAS. They were called, called C8 was the, the, the trade name for those. Automated activated carbon worked really well for them, and those systems lasted a very long time. We're not seeing the same type of um, activation time on the new PFAS compounds. Um, we have a lot more more rapid breakthrough through that carbon media, so then you just have to replace it a lot quicker, and it's really, really expensive. So we know grossly how to treat it, but beyond that, we just we don't know, you know, chemically and how long is it, how long is they how long are they persistent in the environment? Um, are there ways, other treatment techniques that you can use? Just uncharted waters for us. Along those lines, uh, we get to interact with Justin and myself get to interact with a lot of water treatment plant operators, and and that is a job that is going to be in in demand in the near future. Um, if you think about Clean Water Act and the establishment of the high EPA, that was early 70s. You get a lot of people that are working as sanitary engineers and working at these water treatment plants that are close to retirement. And they're quickly noticing that we're not training the next generation of water treatment plant operators. So even though there's some of this stuff that is alarming, as this, this direct publisher said, that's a pretty stressful job that the clean water for your community rests on your shoulders. But there's a lot of opportunities to, to get into that space, to learn about new techniques, new treatment, uh, treatment options, and things like that. So if you're, if you're thinking about engineering or this idea of water treatment and clean water, uh, now's a good time to be thinking about that and striking. And if, you, and if you find a solution on harmful algal blooms, there's something called the Barley Prize. You're familiar with the Barley Prize, Jason. It's a $10 million. You find the solution, you can, you can win $10 million. Lake Okeechobee is just as green as Lake Erie is sometimes, too. So there's a, a group there that has a kind of a benefactor that's put up $10 million to uh, come up with the best the best solution for treatment for, for hats, and they got a $10 million prize on dangling out there. So anybody out there doesn't want to be a drinking water operator, you got the silver bullet. Ten million dollars, you could just retire right now. Any other questions? Uh, Dr. Bobby, yeah. You said that there's a quite robust monitoring that's going on right now. Are you seeing trends of stability within the environment? How is this? Is the use of this ratcheting back increasing? So are you seeing the sites that you've been monitoring for a bit? Are they getting worse or better or what? Where we have a, you saw the pincushion network that we've got around right pad and Dayton. We don't have it much else across the state, so this is new for us. This is new for us. We just, we just don't know. And where we're tracking it at Wright Path and City of Dayton is really just watching the down gradient, uh, down gradient movement of this material based on pumping rates that Dayton has. They're modulating how they run those pumps so that they don't pull it uh, directly into the Huffman Dam, which is their major supply of water for 2.5 million people, which they know they have it in there. They just don't want to get it over the concentration of treatability. We're, we're yet to really get out and do a significant treatment or a significant uh, sampling regime either in, in groundwater. We've got a massive groundwater network across the state. I've been reluctant to frankly go pull the samples um, in all of these places. For, for number one, I didn't have the way to test it. I don't have the equipment to do it, but I do now. And, and two, frankly, what do I tell people? What do I, what do I tell them? I've got a number. I've got a number that, that it could be five, it could be 14, it could be 50, or it could be 70. Um, what, do, what do I tell somebody to do? Either yes, you have to treat it, or yes, your water is safe or not. So it's not the fact that we're not doing it with our eyes wide open to say we need to do it. We just we need to get some answers to those risk questions or some of the technical issues work out before we jump in with both feet. No, not Nothing against um, my counterparts and friends in the state up north, but they have decided that they're going to test every public water supply um, by the end of 2018. And when I asked them, what are you going to do with the results, they said, we're, we're going to make it transparent. And I, I, I applaud that, put them on our website, great. I said, what message are you going to be giving to the public about the risk of that material since you don't know what the, the actual numbers are? And they don't have an answer to that. Great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you all. Well, thanks. Enjoy the rest of your time here on the island. I know you got exams.